Okay. Hello, hi there. My name is Sarah, and today I'm going to be talking about the phylum Echinodermata. So let's begin, shall we? Okay, the thing is, before I talk about this topic, what are echinoderms? The thing is, I actually spoiled it for you right in the first slide. You saw some starfishes, right? But it's not entirely just starfishes. There are other organisms under this phylum, not only just starfishes. But, okay, let's first separate this word first. Echino and derms. What is echino? Basically, echino are anything that is spiky, anything that's spiny, and another word, pointy, and also prickly. So, basically, echino are anything that's spiky, spiny, pointy, and prickly. But what is derm? Derm isn't just another fancy dancy way of saying skin. So, in conclusion, echinoderms are actually organisms that are spiky, spiny, and anything like that. But what organisms other than starfishes are under this description? So, in this next slide, here are some organisms that are spiky, spiny, prickly, and everything like that. So here's a starfish. They come in different shapes and sizes and colors. Here's a sand dollar. Uh, they're quite round. They don't look like dollars. <laughs> here's a sea urchin. They're very prickly. And here's a sea cucumber. They look like sea slugs. In other words, they're sea slugs. Uh, here's sea feathers. They're very glorious and they're very majestic. And here, it's not a starfish, but it is a sea brittle. They're quite similar to starfishes, but they're very different. Uh, they have more arms and they have different and they have different uh, reasons why they are different. So the thing is, all of these organisms they are not the same, and but they are still under the same family. Why is that? In today's video, I'm going to be explaining to you why they are different. So brace yourselves. For this video, uh, I'm going to be talking about the life history and ecology, uh, the phylum characteristics, and also the class diversity. And under the class diversity, I will be talking about each and every one of these organisms. So stay tuned. So first, let's dive in. Let's talk about the life history and ecology. Uh, I purposely chose this picture because it's funny. So uh, kids, a kid goes to a German aquarium and says, hey mom, look, it's a dolphin. And here's a picture of Adolf Hitler on a dolphin. It's funny. <laughs> Let's talk about the life history and ecology. So the thing is about any organisms that are under the phylum Echinodermata is that they all have existed uh, during the Cambrian age and they still exist until now. And that's why you can still see them today. Uh, all of these organisms are marine. So if you think that they are on land, don't be dumb. They are all sea creatures. You cannot find them on land. Uh, they're all benthic, which means they're all bottom dwellers. It means you can only find them at the bottom of the sea. They are not swimming around on the surface just like that. They're just at the bottom of the sea. Uh, and most Paleozoic echinoderms were sessile, meaning uh, sessile is just another way of saying that they're immobile. They don't move a lot. Uh, while most living echinoderms can creep from place to place. And by creep, you could say that they crawl on the uh, floor of the sea. Uh, many, starfishes, uh, many starfishes are predators. Sand dollars and ephoroids. Ephoroids is another way of saying sea brittle, by the way often feed on detris. What detris is, is basically decaying organisms, let it be animals or plants. Uh, sea urchins uh, scrape algae from rocks. Algae is just another version of moss, but water. Like Algae normally floats on the surface of waters, but since sea urchins are bottom dwellers, they are found on rocks in the bottom of the ocean. So reproduction in echinoderms is typically by external fertilization, meaning that their eggs and sperms are freely discharged into the water. But I haven't added uh, the fact that reproduction in uh, organisms in the phylum echinoderms are actually two different types of reproductions. They reproduce sexually and asexually, but I will continue explaining in just a bit. Uh, next, we are going to talk about the phylum characteristics. Now, these are very general characteristics of what I'm going to be talking about. They're basically all of the organisms and they're not very specific of which uh, class of the organism is. So uh, in this chapter, the subtopic, I shall be talking about uh, feeding, respiration, uh, ex internal transport, excretion, uh, locomotion, and also reproduction. And you, here you can see a sea urchin moving. It's so creepy. <laughs> okay. Let's go for let's go to feeding. Okay, so in feeding, we're gonna talk about the starfish first. Uh, so starfishes are carnivorous, carnivorous, carnivores. They're carnivorous, carnivores. 
They don't eat plants, they eat meat. Uh, so they use their tube feet to pry open shells of clams, oysters, and small fish. Uh, starfishes excrete an enzyme and digest the prey of its own shell. Ooh, that's gross. Uh, some, uh, some starfishes eat snails, corals, and other echinoderms, meaning that this guy right here, he can eat his own mother or father. Basically, starfishes can eat other starfishes and or any organisms that are in its own phylum. Why? <laughs> okay, so starfishes, they have two stomachs. Uh, the first one is the cardiac and the second one is the pyloric. Uh, so the cardiac stomach is a large oral stomach that uh, receives ingested food. And the pyloric is a smaller or boral stomach that absorbs digested food. So in this next slide here, I can show you a picture of a starfish not hugging a clam, but eating a clam. Uh, so basically he's trying to turn this clam around using its tube feet so he could uh, can just engulf him. And here's another picture of a starfish eating a fish, a small fish. Uh, and this next video I'm gonna show you is that a starfish is eating a clam right here. So right here, you can see these tiny little things right here, right? Those are called tube feet. So tube feet are basically these tiny little feet that assist uh, starfishes and other uh, organisms under the phylum Echinodermata, and it helps them grab, just take hold of whatever it's trying to grab. They use they use tube feet to eat, they use tube feet to move, and etc. Lots of things, really. So he was just trying to eat that clam. He wasn't trying to hug him or anything. He was just trying to eat him. Uh, next, we're going to talk about the feeding under sea urchins. Uh, sea urchins are herbivores, which means they eat plants, and they eat, they scrape algae from rocks using their five part jaw. Uh, sea lilies and sea feathers are filter feeders, which means they use their tube feet and flexible arms to capture plankton. Uh, sea cucumbers are detrous feeders, and what detrous feeders are, uh, detrous feeders are basically organisms that eat decaying organisms, just like I said before. Uh, they bulldoze the seafloor, this thing is really annoying, they bulldoze the seafloor eating sand and detrus, and they digest organic matter and poop it out. In this picture right here, you can see a sea cucumber eating sand and I think this is a trail of poop maybe or maybe it's footprints I cannot tell. <laughs> Next we're going to be talking about respiration and in respiration uh, gases diffuse across the thin walls of the tube feet. Uh, you can see down here this is an image of a starfish's leg or arm whatever you could say and down here is the tube feet. Basically these things uh, these assist in respiration. Some species have small outgrowths called skin gills. So not all of starfishes have uh, skin gills. Some of them do, some of them don't. Uh, next, we're going to talk about the eternal transport. Now, the thing about these organisms, uh, all of these starfishes, all these uh, sea cucumbers, all of these sea feathers, etc., everything, they all don't have circulatory system, which means they don't have blood running through their veins or anything like that. But the thing is, these organisms are special because they carry out respiration and removal of metabolic waste via their tube feet and or their skin gills, just like I said before here. So the nutrients are distributed by dust digestive glands and fluid within their body cavities. Uh, they rely on colomic movement and silomic fluid within their body cavities to help them move. Uh, next, we're gonna talk about excretion. So excretion is the solid waste exit via the anus, exception for brittle stars because they don't have an anus. Therefore, they have to release feces from their mouth. Can you imagine pooping through your mouth? <laughs> Uh, metabolic waste, such as ammonia, diffuses out of their tube feet or skin gills. So in this picture right here, you can see uh, this is a starfish and this is its anus. And here's a sea cucumber pooping right now. I cannot tell if that's the mouth or if that's the anus. Uh, here's a gif I found on the internet, a sea cucumber pooping. <laughs> I need to grow up. <laughs> okay, uh, next, uh, we're going to be talking about locomotion. So locomotion, it really depends on the class or you could say the type of organism under the phylum Echidonomata. So starfishes, sea feathers, sea brittles, and everything else, they all have different ways of moving. It really depends on the species right here. Uh, most of the organisms under this phylum though, they have tube feet and they have thin muscle fibers attached to the endoskeleton plates to move. What plates means is just another word of saying their own skin or their own body, the outside layer. Uh, okay, so some of them creep, some of them crawl, some of them flap their wings. By creep, you mean they just move around. 
Some of them crawl, some of them flap. Flap is like sea feathers because they just are majestic creatures as they are moving around like a feather. Uh, here are some gifs I found online. Let's see, these are uh, starfishes. And you can see down here, he's trying to move using his tube feet. Yeah, they used their tube feet. You can't really see here and it's quite slow. But in this gif right here, you could see that it's moving using his tube feet against the glass of an aquarium. And here is a sea urchin moving. So you can see his spiky spines just moving around. Pretty, basically, he's creeping around. Next, we're gonna talk about reproduction. Like I said, I was gonna talk about asexual and, re and asexual and sexual. So the thing is, when it comes to reproduction in these organisms, they usually have separate sexes, although some of them are hermo hermaphrodites uh, or dioecious. Uh, what this means is that these organisms, they have two genders, just like us. They have female and male. Uh, they carry out sexual reproduction, entails uh, external fertilization, uh, which means they have larvae that are free swimming. They have a sperm and egg that's just in the, it's just free swimming in the water. I have no idea why. <laughs> and they, ha they also reproduce asexually uh, via fragmentation. What is fragmentation? Fragmentation is basically when the parent splits accidentally or on purposely and then produce two more offsprings. But the thing is, there ha there is a specific criteria for them to reproduce like this. It has to have the center here. So this image is quite incorrect. But you understand what you mean. <laughs> you understand what I mean, sorry. Uh, next subtopic we're going, to, we're going to be talking about is the class diversity. And I purposely chose this picture because it explains different classes of each of these organisms. So under the, under the echinoderm, they all have evolved differently throughout time. Uh, but mostly you could say that all of them evolved from sea stars. Uh, quite amazing, right? Because, you know, they all have a star shape somewhere. So they came from sea stars and then they came from crinoids. Uh, I'm not going to be covering crinoids, by the way. Uh, so they came from sea stars and then they evolved to sea cucumbers, sea, uh, sorry, brittle stars or sea brittles, sea urchins, and sand dollars. They all evolved into different kinds of shapes and sizes throughout time. And that's why they are amazingly shaped, created by God. <laughs> First, we're going to talk about the class Asteroidea, which in other words is the starfish. I purposely chose this picture because it's funny, because he has a butt. <laughs> okay, so in this class, there are around 1,500 species, and usually they have five arms that radiate from the center. They have movable and fixed spines. They have they move oral and aboral surfaces. Uh, what the statement means is that uh, starfishes, they normally move on just flat grounds. They don't, you don't normally find them floating around just like in water. They're normally on the ground, on the floor, or on surfaces of an aquarium, something like that. They just stick onto something. They're like glue or something. They have suction cups. Uh, they have tube feet that move in stepping motions coordinated by the nervous system. Isn't that cool? Uh, most starfishes are predators, which means, of course, they eat meat. Feeding on sessile or slow moving prey, such as mollusks and barnacles. Interesting. Uh, next class we're going to talk, we're going to talk about is the Europh Euphoroidia, which is, in other words, a sea brittle. See right here? This is not a starfish, this is a sea brittle. They're very different. Here's another picture. Uh, the difference between the sea star and a sea brittle is that they have different arms. See, a starfish has is fully connected to its body, but sea brittles, they have really extended long arms, quite like snake arms. Uh, you could say that uh, there are around 2,000 plus species of sea brittles, and brittle stars that's a different name you could call. Brittle stars have long, flexible arms. Another common name for uh, another common name is euphoid, euphoroids, uh, also known as snake stars, and they're the most diverse group. Uh, they have centric disc that's pentagonal. Right here, you see it's pentagonal, and they have two feet, but they don't have suction cups, and that's the difference between starfishes and sea brittles. They don't have suction cups, and they don't stick to walls just like starfishes. They have snake-like locomotion. <laughs> Next on our list is the class Echinoidea, which in other words is the sea urchins and sand dollars. Look how cute that guy is. Uh, okay, so sea urchins, uh, they're found at the very bottom of the ocean, and they're normally considered a delicacy to Japanese people and Korean people in Asian countries. Uh, you don't eat the spiky parts, you eat the insides, and the inside parts is what the, mo the part is edible is the gonads. I have no idea why people would even consider eating this in the first place. Sand dollars, on the other hand, 
uh, you can't, it's really hard to find sand dollars unless they're dead. Uh, you can normally find them on the side of the beaches and that's when they're actually turned into calcium carbonate when they're normally dead. Uh, but if you do find them alive, you could see that they have moving tube feet moving around and that's quite cool. Uh, there are normally a thousand species of these sea urchins and sea dollars and they're very con and they're considered very spiky and spiny. They attach to hard substrates or bury in sand and that's why they're always on the floor. They don't normally stick around floating in the water just like that. Uh, they have a skeleton known as a test, uh, which is made up of 10 sets of closely fitted plates. And what it means by fitting plates is that they have limited movement. I mean, how hard is it to be them just to move? They have a strict fixed shape for them. That's why they have limited movement. And that's why they crawl or creep. Um, some sea urchins have shark spines and venom. Therefore, you have to be careful around sea urchins. They could kill you. <laughs> Next class is the holothuroidea. In other words, the sea cucumber. I cannot tell if this guy's eating him or if this... Yeah, I don't know what's going on in this game. <laughs> okay, sea cucumbers, they look like turds. That's all I could say to you. They look like sea slugs. They're like the slugs of the ocean. Uh, there are around 1,500 species, and they are generally long and worm-like. Uh, they don't look much like starfishes and sea lilies. That's because they evolve very differently from them. They like arms, if you notice. They don't have arms. They're just like worms. They look like slugs. They're mostly sluggish, burrowers, and creepers. Uh, their locomotion is using tube feet is inefficient, meaning it's not very good. It's not very impressive. They're not very fast. They're quite slow. And the contraction of body wall muscles produce worm-like movements. And that's why they, they move like worms. Uh, the next on our list, and I think this is the last one on our list, we're going to be talking about the class Crinoidea, uh, the majestic sea feathers and sea lilies. And this is my favorite. Uh, they look really, they look like plants, but they're not. They're really pretty. Uh, so here's some pictures, and this is sea feathers, and this is sea lilies. They're, they're quite, they quite, look quite similar, but they're not. They're very different. So, uh, in sea lilies and sea uh, feathers, there are around 630 species. It's not much, but they're the most primitive of all living echinoderms. They're the ones, there are our ancestors, or you could say something like that. They're the oldest living ones. Uh, the living stock crinoids mostly inhibit deep water and therefore difficult to, for an average uh, underwater enthusiast to sw uh, observe. In other words, it's really hard to find these guys because these guys are, ver are located at the very bottom of the ocean. And if you want to see them, you have to have really strong lungs or you just have to wear a diver suit in order to see them. They're located deep in the water and it's really hard to find them. Uh, sea lilies are, are attached permanently to a substrate by stalk. Uh, normally people mistaken them for plants, but they're not plants. Uh, sea feathers swim by raising and lowering their arms. Uh, I think I showed you a GIF or a video just now previously throughout this entire slide, and you know you could see how it moves. Um, you can find videos and or Google how they move, how all of these guys move. And that's all for me. Uh, I hope you enjoy my presentation or my video. Uh, hopefully, you guys can learn something. And if I do have uh, any information that is incorrect, I do apologize. But that's all for me. Thank you for watching. Have a nice day. Thank you.